Hey everyone, Kevin Anderson here with Healthmark Industries. Uh, looking forward to getting into another quick tips video for you. This one's going to be all about whether or not your heat sealer is working correctly. So how would you know if it's working correctly? Uh, what can you do about it? And how do you institute a quality process around it? So before we get into that, though, I just want to remind you all to please subscribe to our channel, the Healthmark Education YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to be working really hard to bring more video content out your way. Uh, great little educational clips on demand for you right where you are. So I hope you're enjoying them and I hope you subscribe to the channel. That being said, let's get into this video about heat sealers. Uh, this picture right here, uh, I snapped it uh, for a reason. Obviously, I wanted to showcase the heat seal in this particular video. So I'm going to draw your attention down to the heat seal. Now, one of the things that prompted me to take this picture in the first place is the fact that I saw two heat seals at the bottom of that peel pouch. Now, this happens. I, I remember this happening in the operating room when I was an OR nurse. And the reason it was happening was because at the time, we had been complaining that the seals weren't holding up. The seals weren't strong enough. Uh, peel pouch items were falling out and getting contaminated, and then we couldn't use them. So the staff in the SPD started putting a second seal on the peel pouch. Now, while I understand that, this is a true indicator or a symptom that we have a problem, all right? And adding that second seal really isn't going to help you. Um, I know it seems like it's going to help you, but it's not getting to the root cause of the problem. Now, I wanted to share a second observation with these heat seals in particular. Uh, it might be a little bit hard to see, so I'm going to point it out, but there are defects in this heat seal. There's one right there and there's another one, okay? And uh, additionally, those defects reproduce themselves in the heat seal below it. So now you have two heat seals that both have defects in them. And we know we, we have a problem that we're just reproducing. We're not fixing the problem. We're not getting to the root of the problem. And just in case those defects are still really hard for you to see, I did add this blown up picture uh, that would hopefully uh, illustrate it a little bit better. But just as a reminder, this is a sterile barrier system. So in my mind, if there is a defect at all, even if it's a small one like you see here that I had to blow up, that defect is too much. There should be zero defect across the seal line. You won't see it on the seals that come pre-manufactured and sent to you. So we don't want that happening with the ones that we're performing in our, de in our department. Now, so hopefully your eyes are a little bit more trained to see what the defects look like, maybe what some symptoms look like. And so I just wanna show you another example real quick. Uh, hopefully now, uh, that we looked at the other one, the defects are kind of jumping out at you uh, as we look at this picture. But I saw three defects. There might even actually be more there, but three of them jumped out at me right away. And of course, this is a double peel pouch item. So we saw those defects repeat themselves on the second pouch. So again, we have a problem that's reproducing itself and it will probably continue to get worse if we don't do something about it. So before we get to that doing part, like taking action, we want to understand some basic things about the heat sealers themselves. So let's get into that part. There are several different types of heat sealers. These two are the most common that I've seen when I go out and about and I get into departments. All right. The one on the left there, that one is a continuous feed type um, heat sealer. And the one on the right is a bar type heat sealer both are very good equipment the one on the left you might see more on the industrial side too as well but again you do see it in uh, sterile to pro uh, sterile processing departments as well um, the bar type heat sealer has some nuances with it that you need to understand that are very important and that i'm concerned some of the training components aren't getting out there to everybody and that's why we're seeing defective seals like that so there's a knob on each side of uh, these units, and that is there so that you can rotate the filament. There's a filament on the inside 
that helps uh, create that seal during the process. The process of sealing takes heat, contact time, and pressure. And that filament is an integral part in this type of heat sealer. And when we don't do the rotation of that filament, this is what happens. It gets burned and overused, and then it, 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 it fails to create 100% high quality seal across the board. Uh, another thing to note here is that you can tell that people are using the same area of the heat sealer. They're probably right-handed. They're putting it a little bit slightly off to the right of the center uh, because they're using their left hand to operate the bar. Who knows? That's just a guess, but they're not rotating the part of the bar that they're using and they're not rotating uh, the filament either. So most likely this was a heat sealer that was producing defective heat seals. So that's one thing to really look out for with that bar type heat sealer. Use it correctly and it will treat you well, okay? Uh, otherwise, you might have heat seals that look like this. This one was one of the worst I've ever seen uh, in a department. And that's because it looks to me like at least 60% of the seal isn't even sealed at that point in the corner there. So that's a huge problem that we want to make sure that people are aware of and that they're they're uh, equipped to deal with it. So another component to be aware of with heat sealers is that we're going to have to be able to understand the temperatures of the heat seal itself. I, we talked about one of the factors being the heat uh, that's going to come up a little bit bigger uh, in the next slide. But how on each type of uh, heat sealer do you manage the temperature? That's what's important. So the one on the left is a dial type. Not really sure why it's a one through 11, how that equates to temperature, but find out in your IFU how it does so that you can adjust it accordingly. The one on the right is a toggle switch uh, for the temperature. So there's various ones out there. Some of them have digital readouts, which is nice and uh, digital switches as well. So it just depends on your manufacturer, get into that IFU and understand how to manage the temperature. Why is that important? All right, we have different types of peel pouches. We have ones for steam and ETO, ethylene oxide. We have Tyvek pouches for vaporized hydrogen peroxide or Sterad VPRO, whatever you have. Um, the difference is they both require different temperatures. So get into the IFUs of your peel pouches. The one on the left for steam, that one is 329 to 392 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas the Tyvek one goes from 248 degrees to 266 degrees. There's a pretty significant difference there. You, if you don't swap that temperature out correctly, you could either burn a, a, a pouch or you could create a seal that's too weak and, and not going to hold up. So it's really important. I've seen some departments, they'll have a heat sealer uh, designated for those steam pouches and a heat sealer designated for the Tyvek pouches separately so they don't have to switch between the two temperatures. Just an idea, you don't have to do it, uh, but if you do, it's a good idea because you'll always have a backup heat sealer as well in case one breaks down or needs to go out for service. So just an idea that I would throw out there uh, again, you don't have to do it that way. So another thing that's really important with these heat sealers is that um, it is common now, and we've even heard back feedback from customers that accreditation agencies are coming into the department. They're asking about this piece of equipment and they're asking, how are you testing this equipment? How are you verifying that it's working properly? And this, this picture that you see on the right is a very simple uh, dye test that you can do, and it will help you to identify even those small defects that may be really hard to see with the unaided eye so that you can address the problem before it gets really, really bad. So this is one way that you can test your seal and uh, document it. So in case you haven't seen it before, I wanted to show you a quick video of it, which is right here. This is a video that Stephen Kovac did for us. It's a really good video. It's really short and it gives you a, a, a perfect idea of how to run the test and how easy it truly is. So here he is, he's gonna grab one of these dye packs and slide it into the pouch. And you see the arrow is pointing towards the seal side that we're going to heat seal. I'm gonna run it through the heat sealer. 
And then you simply push the die out of the pack, pick it up, and now you can visualize your heat seal. There's no defects there. That's perfect. At that point, you can take a snapshot of it and then upload it into your instrument tracking system or wherever you want to document this procedure. Uh, if you're doing it electronically, that's a great way to do it. Um, but if you want to do the old school way, a lot of people have really good record keeping in the physical form. And here's another uh, variation of a test that you can do where you can just run your heat sealer on it. You can check visually for any defects in it. You date and time it. You write any notes on there if it needed service or anything like that. And then you can file it away. And then when your accreditation surveyor comes in, you can say, yep, we run these daily tests on it. And if something comes up, this is the action we take with uh, clinical engineering. And here's our records to show it. So I hope that gives you a better understanding of how to check your heat sealer, how to maintain it, how to uh, use the IFUs of both the heat sealer and the uh, peel pouch themselves. Okay. Um, there's multiple factors. Remember we talked about temperature, pressure, and contact time. So all of those three things have to be there in order to complete a, a, an adequate seal. So just in review, we want to be able to give you those action steps. Remember to observe and assess, right? Observe that heat seal every single time. Make sure that there are no defects. And if there's any question whatsoever, run one of those die tests and, and make sure with, because that's going to help you understand or help you be able to better visualize it. The other thing is you're going to need a, these uh, machines that are so critical to performing these heat seals to be on a preventive maintenance schedule. Some of them may require calibration, whatever it is, but they need to be on that schedule and it needs to be documented that it's being done. The other thing is, is use those machines, the heat sealers themselves, according to IFU. Use your peel pouches according to IFU. Manage the temperatures. Remember that part. Don't forget to institute a quality management process. Uh, preferably each day that this equipment is in use, run a seal check or a daily seal check test. Document it, which is that last step. And then you have a process that you can be proud of and assured that you're going to produce that perfect seal every single time. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know if you have any comments or questions down in the comments below. Uh, we love to hear from you, but don't forget to subscribe to the channel as we plan on giving you more video content um, in the future. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.